Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for accommodating my change in time frame. Charles, most appreciated. I'm actually speaking the first half on behalf of our sister organisation, the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Research Centre, and I will come on to our main topic for today, which is really to look at the state of the science and the regulatory approach in New Zealand to asparagopsis, bromoform, synthetic bromoform, anything to do with bromoform and what it really means for pasture-based livestock in New Zealand. I failed the IQ test. I'm aiming. Oh, look at that, that's cool. So as Wayne said yesterday, we are AgriZero New Zealand, a small private pub public partnership investing in any tools and technologies that can be developed and deployed to support the reduction of methane and nitrous oxide emissions in New Zealand's pasture-based farming system. So we really are interested in supporting work from a scientific perspective through to startup or mature companies and commercialising products onto farms and supporting farmer uptake when they actually get through our regulatory system. And we have a sister organisation the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre. You will, many of you will know Harry Clark and Sinead Leahy. Sinead is on the Science Advisory Panel of the um, Global Methane Hub, which is fantastic for them and fantastic for New Zealand. And this is a contracting and funding research organisation to support emission reduction in New Zealand's agricultural economy. And that is their official slide and a run through of what they do. So John said yesterday, imagine a farm in New Zealand where our animals are outside for 365 days a year. We have quite a temperate climate in New Zealand. There's a lot of rain, a lot of sun, and we have very few barns in the deep, deep south in winter, our animals head in there. And New Zealand's really quite interesting because we're entirely pasture-based, and we've had quite a change in our agricultural structure over the last 40 years. So back in 1982, we had 22 sheep for every New Zealander. Now we have four, and we've seen a doubling of our dairy herd size. But all in all, it is the backbone of our economy. 13% of people that work in New Zealand work in this sector. 10% of our, of our GDP is in this sector. And 82% of our goods that we export, 95% of everything that we grow in our primary industries is exported offshore. So whilst we are pasture-based and New Zealand focused, in terms of our market, we're entirely responsive and orientated towards what our offshore customers are doing, what our offshore trading partners are doing, and obviously our competitors. And that ranges everything from products and commodities through to the regulatory side. So our need for emissions reduction in New Zealand has never been greater. On a rough calculation, we emit about the same amount of methane as California. The big difference is it's 50% of New Zealand's emissions. So for New Zealand to reach our Paris signed up targets, we have to reduce our methane, um, our methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions. We don't have a question about that. But we are focused on how do we do that by supporting farmers to remain profitable and to not lose productivity. But we are interested in the absolute reduction of these emissions. The other one that really struck me this last few days is the conversation on subsidies. Um, in New Zealand in 1984, the government took subsidies away from farmers. So I found it quite fascinating to hear the conversation over the last two days about the interaction of incentives for farmers and subsidies. And um, I'm not going to deliberately eyeball my colleagues from the Ministry of Primary Industries as to how they've thought about that for their roles going forward. So because we're looking at investing in a range of products, a really growing one, obviously, is bromoform. We've heard it talked about over the last two days. And I read a couple of really interesting student posters on this in the break yesterday, taking photos, and we will be emailing you. And so because bromoform has been emerging as a really promising mitigation tool, but there's a lot of discussion about its effectiveness, toxicity, the science of it, market acceptability, etc. Two or three years ago, the New Zealand AGRC commissioned a report 
to understand the state of science and what it means for New Zealand and our specific exporting and regulatory um, status. So we wanted to identify the gaps, the charter path forward, and so that where we could collaborate both in New Zealand and internationally in the pre-competitive space once we understood what the gaps were. This report is now live on their website. So the report identifies some very key knowledge gaps, some of which we've heard talked about already over the last two days, but a really particular one for New Zealand is this number eight and nine. What's happening? What would it mean for our exports? What would it mean for market considerations? And this pulls back to the topic of this discussion today, which is what does it mean in terms of our regulatory pathway? So how can we work with our regulator as it's looking to develop these up, our regulations around bromoform to support what might come out the other side? So the priority areas found in the report, the key questions that they were put to the authors was around both research and a regulatory approach. And you can see them there. I'm just gonna call out the bottom one and understanding animal welfare. Because in New Zealand, our dairy cattle, for example, live between four and seven years. So there's a number of short-term studies, but if we're going to be feeding or dosing through a, a small, synthetic molecule of bromoform over an extended period of time, what does that mean for animal welfare? You know, what's the metabolic fate of bromoform to the animal? So there's just a bunch of priority questions that came out of this report. And these are the insights and next steps that they recommended. So we at AgriZero, we looked at this report, we thought pretty hard about it, and we looked particularly around the next steps the ones that they had recommended should be taken forward. And we as a business live in the space between the academic world, the venture world, and the world of government. And we decided that this report could be a really interesting piece of work, but we didn't want to risk it going unused and all that hard work going in to create positive change so that we can try and fill some of these gaps. So what we did is we hosted a workshop and we invited 70 people from around New Zealand and then internationally thanks through to Charles and our other connections to really look at the findings of this report. We also invited our regulators into the conversation to listen and in New Zealand we have two regulators that would look at bromoform. So we have the Ministry for Prime Industries looks after and typical vet medicine regulatory approach but we also have the Environmental Protection Agency. So we invited them to speak and talk about how they think about hazardous substances, what would this mean for bromoform, how would it be classified, what kind of toxicity studies would need to be done for them to determine human and environmental uh, impacts and any protective issues that were, were coming up. So we had a really, really interesting debate and, and we know that there's quite a lot of competition in this space and competition is quite healthy. but. Also, there's a bunch of pre-competitive questions that the report identified. So we wanted to workshop those for everyone, including our regulators, to understand what are the common things that we could collectively work for and collaborate in the pre-competitive space going forward. And these are the six opportunities that came out of that workshop. So these are the six areas where all our attendees agreed should be the areas that could exist for collaborative effort and approach in the pre-competitive space. So we here at AgriZero, we have a role to support the collaboration and any connections in the scientific and academic community and through to on-farm adoption to support how these could be taken forward. Because the general consensus in the room and from the authors of the report was if these questions could get answered, it would help enormously, not just in supporting the gaps in bromoform understanding, but also in understanding the portfolio of evidence we're going to need for our regulators. So we watch really carefully at the developments of regulation around not just bromoform, but inhibitors, any efficacy tools across our international markets, whether that's Europe, here in Australia, here in Australia and here in the US. And it's really important if we could get to the holy grail where 
pieces of evidence could be used for approvals across regulators, or at least the portfolio of evidence, standardised scientific tests could be accepted to speed up the application of not just bromoform, but other inhibitor type products, or indeed if we ever hit the holy grail of a vaccine, wouldn't that be amazing, and get it registered through all these countries. So that is on behalf of our sister organisation in AgriZero, um, how I'd like to just leave it with bromoform, but also just to remind you that we as a business are interested in investing in any work that's focused on reducing methane and nitrous oxide emissions. And myself and my, Wayne spoke yesterday, my colleague Sarah, we're here, our, our details are here, and we would love to hear from you if you would like to work with us. Thank you. Okay, I'm now going to ask our other two panelists to come up, um, and that is going to be Perry Ro Rosenstein, the Senior Scientist for Livestock Systems at the Environmental Defense Fund, and Leah Wilkinson, the Vice President of Public Policy and Education at the American Feed Industry Association. One at a time? Okay, just kidding, one at a time. Okay, Perry, come on up. Perry is the, again, the senior scientist at the Livestock Systems at an EDF, and she focuses on methane mitigation and adaptation strategies to address the role of livestock on climate change and the impacts of climate change on livestock systems. She partners with a variety of stakeholders to advance quantification and mit mitigation of enteric and manure methane emissions. Perry is a veterinarian with a background in public health and ep epidemiology. Prior to EDF, she worked for Merck Animal Health in clinical research to develop new companion animal and livestock pharmaceutical and biological products. She holds a veterinary degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine and a bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from Princeton. Please welcome Perry to the stage. These uh, bright colors will keep everyone awake this afternoon. Um, to be clear, though, it's not tie-dye. It's a methane heat map. So I just want to put that out there. Good afternoon. Um, first, I want to echo what many other speakers have already said and thank our organizers for putting together this event. It's been great to be here, and it's my pleasure to be on this panel. I'm Perry Rosenstein, Senior Scientist of Livestock Systems at the Environmental Defense Fund. You've already heard from some of my colleagues, so I'm not going to uh, review any background on the organization, but um, we're all happy to be here and looking forward to talking to everyone we've already gotten to talk to and continuing to talk. So my presentation today is a call to action on scientific research for enteric methane inhibiting solutions. I'm going to be reiterating um, some of the topics that you've already heard, but hoping to synthesize a lot of it here. So this call to action is for scientists, um, for companies developing products, and really for the fields in general. Um, I think this is important alignment, or as Juan says, a common understanding um, that's important for us all to have. So the three components of my call to action are to understand the requirements for regulatory approval, conduct rigorous scientific studies that include key parameters for data collection, and utilize validated methodologies for quantifying methane emissions reductions, and to follow best practices for scientific research. To review, um, I believe there are four key qualities for any successful enteric methane inhibiting product. For one, they have to be effective at reducing enteric methane emissions without causing negative environmental trade-offs. Two, they have to be safe for humans and animals. Three, they have to be widely adopted by the industry. And four, they have to be accepted by consumers. And I would argue that Pretty much the only way to do all of this is to have quality, transparent, rigorous science and federal regulatory approval of products. So why is this call to action important? Um, a lot of people have expressed that we have limited resources for research, which is certainly true. And we need studies that are applicable for regulatory purposes to get these product approved. 
as well as for other contexts. It's helpful we can interpret the results, compare the results, and consider them in, in different ways. So that standardization allows for that interpretation and comparison of results. We've also heard the importance of trust, and trust can come through transparency. So transparency of the process and the results is critical for public confidence in these products. I want to acknowledge some of the individuals and organizations who have been doing a lot of work in this space already. Um, the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, GRA, conducted a flagship project um, where they brought together experts in this space to look at technical guidelines to develop feed additives to reduce enteric methane. I think the work of this group will be invaluable um, as a resource for everyone in this space. This past fall, EDF conducted an expert workshop on demonstrating effectiveness of enteric methane inhibiting products. We brought together scientists from academia, industry, and regulatory agencies to discuss this. It, it obviously has a regulatory focus, um, looking at the US, Canada, and EU in particular, but it was really meant to be product agnostic and therefore pathway agnostic. Um, I'll acknowledge that the focus was largely on feed additives, um, but certainly the concepts apply across the board. So I'd like to share um, the conclusions from that workshop, the findings from the workshop, along with some updates on the regulatory pathways um, in the context of this call to action. I want to also make sure I say I do not speak for FDA CVM or any regulatory agency, um, but we can share our findings that we had from the workshop. So the first part of my call to action was to understand the requirements for regulatory approval. And so that starts with a common terminology. And again, that common understanding will ground all the work that we're doing. These are a few of the important terms here with intended use or that claim um, focused in the middle. I could have made this list incredibly long in this word cloud, but I um, stuck with some of the more common ones and some of the ones that seem to cause some confusion. So I think making sure that we all understand how these terms are used, are, are intended, um, and we're speaking the same language is really helpful. In terms of the regulatory agencies, um, there are a number of different agencies involved. Again, we had a focus on the US, Canada, and EU. So for the US, we have FDA, Center for Veterinary Medicine. For, uh, we also have USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. We have Health Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the European Medicines Agency, and the European Food Safety Authority. And depending on the product and the mode of action, um, these agencies have jurisdiction over the approval processes. And that's a process that's determined by the agencies and their authority, um, and not something that comes from outside. So I shared this slide last year, um, saying that current regulatory, the current regulatory pathway is a barrier to innovation. And at the time, I said that enteric methane inhibi inhibiting feed additives um, were new animal drugs. So they went through a new animal drug application process. And again, we're focused on feed additives in the US here. For everyone taking pictures, I'm about to kind of change things around on you because we've made a lot of progress since last year. And the pathways now look like this. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, FDA has really shown a commitment to um, modernizing the process, modernizing the pathway, really promoting innovation while maintaining those safeguards for human health, animal health, and the environment. Um, I don't want to stay on this slide too long because clearly it was a joke. But um, they, um, in October of 2022, they had a call for a listening session to modernize um, PPM 1240-3605, not to go back too far in history, but that is the policy that um, declared that these products for enteric methane inhibition would be reviewed and approved as new animal drugs. Since then, um, as of February of this past year, or this year rather, um, FDA issued a letter to industry stating their intention to withdraw 1240-3605. And in this letter, they made sure to let industry know to get in touch with them early in the process to figure out what that pathway forward is hot off the press. Um, as of just a few days ago, 1240-3605 has been withdrawn. Um, so that's exciting that we are taking those steps forward. In terms of the future pathway, um, it's in discussion. And um, Leah will present on 
the legislative approach to establishing a pathway for these products. But in the meantime, FDA is making it very clear that they want companies to get in touch, I would argue, early and often um, in the process. And so to that end, I just want to make sure I put that email address up here. So for any companies who are interested in figuring out what their pathway forward is, I highly encourage you to get in touch. So the regulatory pathways are very specific to the region, to the product, as I was mentioning, but there are typically common components. Um, so they include safety, that's human food safety, target animal safety, user safety, making sure that everyone, including the animals, coming in, in touch with, in contact with these products, um, it's safe for them to be around and to consume. Efficacy, environmental assessment, and to some extent in each of the pathways, mode of action. So the second part of my call to action was to conduct rigorous scientific studies that include key parameters for data collection and utilize validated methodologies for quantifying, <clears throat> for quantifying methane emissions reductions. So I think we've heard this um, throughout the, the presentations, but the three most important, I would argue, um, parameters to include in all studies in this area would be dry matter intake, productivity, and methane emissions. And I want to acknowledge that it's easy for me to stand up here and say you have to include all that. We've heard from panelists how challenging it can be to, to include some of those, but it's still critical to do our best to include those, include the methods by which we obtain that information, and certainly the units, um, and include that with our results. This combination not only allows us to know the absolute methane emissions, the methane yield, the methane intensity, but it allows us to interpret each of those in, those, in different contexts. And then another word cloud for you, there are many additional parameters I would make diet. Obviously the biggest here, just because I've seen many studies where the diet has not been included and it's really impossible to interpret the results without knowing what the diet was. Um, but all of these factors are important when you're measuring, how often you're measuring, how you're measuring, um, and the list goes on. Again, I could have made this really extensive, but I didn't wanna clutter it too much. So then tools and methods for quantification, um, there are many different methodologies. And I would say that in a regulatory context, there really isn't a gold standard for these methodologies. Um, there are benefits and limitations to each one, but the unifying concept is that the tools must be calibrated and validated. Um, so the methodology that's used has to be able to support the intended use for the claim, and the data must justify its use. Here I have two of the more commonly um, discussed methods. I have on the right, I have a green or a chamber, uh, respiration chamber. Those are the new ones up at Cornell. And then on the left, I have a green feed. I think we're all well acquainted. The last part of my call to action is to follow best practices for scientific research. And the list of best practices is, again, extensive. Um, I've highlighted a few here. I would say that all studies, if they're going for regulatory approval, certainly, and just generally in this area, if you're saying it's a study for your product, it should be using the product and the delivery method that will be marketed. We can't have other products as stand-ins and, and representing what a product will purportedly do. It has to be the actual product. We have to have controlled studies. We have to have randomization of treatment assignment and masking of study personnel. These can reduce bias. When I say masking in the age of COVID, I feel like I should clarify. We have to make sure that um, individuals who are collecting the efficacy or impact data are not privy to the treatment group. Um, so again, to reduce bias. We have to be clear about what our inclusion and exclusion criteria are for um, the cases that we use in the results. We don't want cherry picking of data. So we have to have clear across the board reasons for why certain cases were included or excluded. And we need to have statistical significance. Um, in the context of a study for regulatory approval, it's really a binary, was there a statistically significant reduction in, in methane emissions or not? Um, but for other purposes, because we want these studies to be able to use for other contexts, if we're coming up with a percentage reduction, we still need statistical significance relative to that percent reduction. And then the last one here is good clinical practices and good laboratory practices. While not necessarily required by all pathways, um, as close as we can get to these specific guidelines for, for conducting studies and, and data collection, 
the higher the integrity of the studies and the results. And so if we can at least aim for it, even when it's not required, I think it will benefit all of us. So there's some obvious barriers that we've all discussed, and I have the same ones listed here. Um, and we have to make steps to closing those gaps um, so that these studies can, can move us forward. So funding is certainly a big area. The high quality research that I'm talking about requires a lot of money. And I think we all are well aware of that and continuing to find ways to close that funding gap is critical. There are also capacity constraints. We need facilities that have the tools um, that we need in order to conduct these studies and the researchers. A lack of researchers with expertise can potentially be a limiting factor. I heard someone mention making sure students are interested in the work. Um, we need to come together as a community to address these obstacles so we can move this forward. I'm not going to reiterate the call to action. I think everyone's heard it enough times, but we need to bring these enteric methane inhibiting solutions to market. In order to do that, we need to support the research that will do it efficiently and effectively. And hopefully I've laid out some of those concepts here. Thank you very much. OK. So next we have Leah Wilkinson. Leah Wilkinson is the American Feed Industry Association's Vice President of Public Policy and Education, and she oversees the association's legislative, regulatory, and policy efforts. Wilkinson joined AFIA in 2010. She interacts with Congress, the Association of American Feed Control Officials, the US FDA, and state legislatures and feed regulatory agencies in the Western US. She is also the staff contact for the AFIA Feed Regulatory Ingredient Approval and Definition and Aquaculture Committee. Um, do you want me to keep going? There's a lot of long bios in here. Come on up, Leah. Okay, uh, I guess the last but not least, right? Um, so, get that to stay. There you go. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak and to uh, pair off of what Perry um, detailed with the challenges that we have. And if for those of you that were here last year and heard our panel, and we were kind of doom and gloom. Um, because there wasn't much of a path forward. We now at least have some idea, um, and that's, that's a great thing for us all. So I'll walk you through uh, a little bit of where and how AFIA got to this point. So our association represents feed manufacturers, pet food manufacturers, ingredient suppliers um, for the animal food industry. And our members have been stymied about bringing any ingredients to the market um, because the processes are slow, they're tedious, the requirements seem to change between one application to another. And so we've been working in this area for years. And the next area after making just the regular ingredient approval processes work better, um, we knew we had this challenge, right? That we had products in the market that wanted to make production claims, these environmental claims, human food safety claims, but they were being regulated as drugs. And so we thought it was time for FDA to modernize that policy and to start thinking of these products as feed ingredients. So the policy memo that Perry mentioned was put in place in 1998. Um, AFIA first started talking to FDA back in 2003. Um, they weren't ready to change at that time, and so we went back to them in 2020 and said, okay, it's time to start working on this and start thinking about it. And they started doing some internal work um, through that time, came out with that listening session. Congress also got involved, and there was report language that um, Congress was telling FDA to modernize this policy thinking and change it. And so we finally got to the point where in February they decided they were going to rescind the policy memo. And on Monday, they officially did it. So that's huge because now the pathway is at least relatively open, even if it is blurred. So they their doors open. They want people to come in and talk to them. Um, it might look like a very jagged path. Um, until we get the legislation I'm gonna talk about, um, but at least it's something, right? And some of the products may still be classified as drugs, um, but some of them may be able to go through a feed ingredient pathway. 
So, yay, progress. Um, but as FDA was doing this in this review, uh, AFI thought they could make this policy decision without needing legislative authority. They can do it for production claims, but any of these non-nutritive products that want to make environmental claims, food safety claims, they would, they would like legislation um, to make it very clear and that it stands up to legal scrutiny and you as a company don't get sued, them as the approver don't get sued. So that's what's led us to the Innovative Feed Act. And the Innovative Feed Act is legislation that would modify the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. It would create a new food additive category. We'll talk about what those are in a little bit. Um, again, it's these non-nutritive products. They work within the digestive tract. And specifically for the label claim area of human food safety, altering the microbiome, and for environmental impact. So the zootechnical animal food substances, again, so this is all detailed in the four pages of legislation, um, but it would have to be something that's non-nutritive. And again, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act defines food as taste, nutrition, or aroma. So that was the uh, round hole that our products were having to try to go through with a square peg, right? And so now by adding this non-nutritive category as a food additive, it would allow some of these products and you won't have to try to prove that they provide taste, nutrition, or aroma, which was really some of the barriers uh, to getting products through as a feed ingredient um, before. Again, they're gonna solely work within the animal's um, gastrointestinal tract, and then the three areas looking at affecting the byproducts of the digestive process. So this used to say, environmental and we've changed it we've softened that language um, as some of the feedback that we were hearing um, and so the um, so that's what we're, what we're looking at and what we're talking about on the environment space uh, reducing the foodborne pathogens and this one is limited to food from food producing animals so it would not encompass any of our companion animal um, or equine diets and then uh, the last one is affecting the structure function of the body by altering the microbiome. So let's talk a little bit about where we are. So I think last year we had this concept of a, of a piece of legislation that was coming. We now have um, two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate. And if you uh, know or you, you know, did um, Schoolhouse Rock, and no, you know, I'm just a bill. Um, that's how things are supposed to work. You're supposed to have a bill introduced in both bodies of Congress. So one in the Senate, one in the House. Um, and ideally, they pass both bodies. They go through committee. They go through the full body. They, if they have any differences, they get conferenced. And then the president signs it, right? Um, that's not how our system really works right now, but it's very key um, to this specific topic that we have bills introduced in both the House and the Senate. So things are pretty partisan in our in the nation's capital right now. Um, so having a bill that's been introduced that's bipartisan in both bodies um, is is really remarkable. And so we have. The bill came in first in the Senate, um, and we've got Senators Marshall and Moran from Kansas, Senator Baldwin uh, from Wisconsin, and then Senator Bennett from Colorado. Those were the leads. Uh, those original sponsors were able to get it on a piece of legislation that was moving last year and actually got passed, but when in the function of our um, society today, they stripped all the amendments when it actually went to the president. So our amendment and other amendments that had been offered were removed from that legislation. But what's happened is we actually had that bill pass committee and it passed the full Senate. So that's good, right? We've made progress, even though it didn't ultimately get to the president. So since then, we learned a lot last summer, and we realized that um, we needed to get the House of Representatives on board. That's where we were kind of stuck. And so we've put all of our attention on the House and getting a bill introduced there, which happened in December. 
And we've been working to grow the list of co-sponsors and specifically looking at um, the Republicans in the House uh, because they're the, the body of, they're the party in control of that body. Um, so right now we're at 30 co-sponsors total in the House um, and in the, the Senate we're up to 10 um, and we really hadn't been working in the Senate but we're starting to get more um, energy there in the Senate as well. But where you can come in um, is we've got broad support for the bill and we continue to use that when we're talking up um, in Capitol Hill. So we've got 197 different national and state associations and then industry, um, so companies that are on a letter. And if you're interested on either checking if your company is or getting signed onto that letter, please let me know and I can, I can help you with that. So we are looking to move this legislation on any vehicle that is moving and it's an election year so there's not going to be a whole lot that's happening but there will be some key pieces of legislation that will move and we will continue to look and hopefully we have enough support that when the day comes um, when our time is we can get put on as an amendment um, to to whatever legislative vehicle is moving so how can you help? Um, we've got a website um, and you can kind of see how you can build to it down there at the bottom where you can go and learn more. We've started kind of the tagline of let's feed them the good stuff. We um, did some ads last week in one of the um, DC press uh, newsletters. Uh, so we're trying to continue to get the energy for the bill. And then we have an advocacy center that's set up. So if you go on that QR code, it will take you to our um, advocacy center and you can send a letter to your congressman. Um, it will, all you do is put in your address and your zip code and it will populate it and it will send it off to your California senators and your local representative or whatever state you're in. Um, and you're asking them to help co-sponsor the bill, all right? So co-sponsor and support final passage of the bill. And it's this grassroots activity that really um, helps amplify the message so that they're hearing from multiple people um, in their district and realizing that this is something that is important back to their producers um, and to your feed company or you as a general citizen. Um, and so we encourage you to, to use this. You can tweak the message and change it to make it personal. Um, and you can share it out amongst your um, companies or staff as well. So then I was asked a little bit, um, one of the other things AFIA is doing is not only talking about we need this legislative pathway, right? The ability to bring ingredients to the market but then let's talk about once we have ingredients approved, how can we get them into the hands of producers? And are there uh, methods for incentivizing or having some cost share dollars um, to offer back to the producer? And we've been working with the US Department of Agriculture, with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, so Robert Bonney's group, and um, now we have a bill that's been introduced in the Senate as well that will help in this area. So it's called the Emit Less. And again, it's Senator Bennett um, and Baldwin and Moran, who you recognize from the Innovative Feed Act. And then you add in Senator Crapo from Idaho in as original co-sponsors here. So it's this bill, because we love acronyms. Um, so it's the Enteric Methane Innovation Tools. So that's the Emit um, for Lower Emissions and Sustainable Stock um, Act of 2024. So that's the emit less part. It's really focused on uh, prioritizing and, and expanding research in, um, in the area of feed ingredients and other tools for mitigating methane emissions. And then also um, looking at the conservation program. So there's a feed management standard within NRCS and really just codifies the ability for feed management to include feed ingredients in um, that program and therefore the producers being eligible for cost share dollars. There are um, components of this bill that have been so far included in the Senate version of the Farm Bill. Um, so we haven't seen the actual legislative text from the Senate yet, uh, but in the section by section, there's several areas that 
take the components of the emit, emit less bill um, and would put that into the farm bill. And um, I got word just this afternoon that the entire emit less uh, bill has been offered as an amendment to the House Farm Bill um, when it's going to be marked up in committee tomorrow. I don't know that it will pass the House um, in that committee. Um, it's being offered by a Democrat and probably just a very few Democratic amendments I think will pass. But um, it, it's there. People are aware of it um, and realizing that this is another important piece uh, to the solutions that we need. There you go. Thank you very much. I have five minutes for questions for either of these two, if anybody has any of those. Oh, I see one. You can sit or stand, it doesn't matter. There you go. <clears throat> so in the uh, language of the zootechnical animal feed substance pathway, it says products that act solely within the gastrointestinal tract. If a product under its intended use, I'm gonna use that, um, demonstrates residues in milk, could that be considered as acting only within the gastrointestinal tract? So one of the first hurdles that companies are going to have to do when you go to FDA is proving that your product works solely within the gastrointestinal tract, right? And um, how you prove that is going to be some of those conversations that you have with CVM, as Perry said, early and often, um, so that you're designing your studies appropriately. If it comes to a product like that where it may still be acting outside, I think that's where by rescinding the policy memo, it gives them some flexibility to to work outside of what they have now, right? Right now it's just a drug. And so they can still, I think, be able to fit things in. Again, you're gonna, to be solely a food additive though, it will have to work within the digestive tract. I'm getting my steps in today, unlike the rest of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess it's a similar question. Uh, it's another aspect of the ZAFs list you had there, the non-nutritive piece. Um, so I have an additive that reduces methane by whatever percent and increases productivity. Um, does that mean that I can only uh, register that and claim the reduction of methane and nothing about productivity because that is determined as nutritive or what's the interplay there? So in order to make the environmental claim, right, um, you would have to be a ZAF, the zoo technical animal food substance. Um, to do any sort of production claim, even whether it's um, non-nutritive or nutritive, right? There's more flexibilities there. So you would still go through, I think you would be putting in for both your productivity and your environmental claim at the same time, and they would review it that way. But the, nutri the nutritive production claims can go in other pathways, right? So the other approval pathways. Yeah, I was only going to add, I think the reason it's included there is because you're, it's all about the intended use again. So you, why are you feeding it in the first place? And so if you're feeding it for enteric methane reduction, you're not feeding it for nutritional purposes. So I think that's the distinction that's made in that bill. Thank you both very much. Um, uh, do you know if the FDA is collaborating with the likes of the AMA, the APVMA, et cetera, et cetera, so that people don't have to submit one application in the US, one in Europe, one in all that sort of stuff? Because, you know, that 
greatly adds to the the regulatory burden having to submit multiple multiple and like japan where you traditionally have to do the trials in japan is there any collaboration at that level to try and streamline some of those processes i mean that's the holy grail right there right <clears throat> so the closest that they are getting right now is working through um, a group that we call the iccf and it is looking at all of the requirements between the European Union, Canada, and the United States for your studies. And so trying to set the bar that says in your toxicology studies, this is what you have to meet to meet all three jurisdictions requirements. And then, um, so ideally you could do one study to meet all of those jurisdictions. This is modeled after the VICH, which is the animal pharmaceutical um, model. And they have been around for almost three decades. So they're much further along than we are um, in the animal feed world. And they're to a point where they are starting to do cooperative approvals. And so ultimately, I think that's where we would like to get with this. Um, we're not there yet, but. And just to add to that, um, CVM has issued um, some guidance on how to leverage studies that have been done outside of the US in a US regulatory approval process. And so your question, I think, was more forward looking. And I think that's exactly what Leah answered. But in a retrospective approach, there's also ways to leverage um, data that's already been collected elsewhere. Um, those requirements may be strict and maybe challenging to meet at times. Um, and I think that's partially because of the need to have a representative situation of what will be would be going on in the US. And so there might be incompatibilities in how studies were conducted. But there is an effort to enable that. Thank you. I think that was the last question we have time for. So thank you both very, very much. And um, please join me in giving our presenters a round of applause.